Lierre Keith has been a radical feminist for 40 years. She is the author of seven books, including The Vegetarian Myth, Food, Justice, and Sustainability, which has been called the most important ecological book of this generation. She is co-author with Derek Jensen and Max Wilbert of Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It. She lives in Northern California with giant trees and giant dogs. <laughs> she has been arrested six times for acts of political resistance. Lierre is a familiar and well-loved speaker to most of us involved with WDI USA and Women's Liberation Front or WOLF. Today, Lierre will, will speak about liberal versus radical feminism. What is oppression? What is women's oppression? What is political resistance? And why resistance movements need a supportive culture of resistance? We're delighted to welcome you, Lierre Keith. Well, you've heard of speed dating. This is speed revolution. So this is the debt that all radicals owe to Karl Marx. And you certainly don't need to be any kind of Marxist, but he is the one who chalked this out for us. Um, liberals believe that society is made up of individuals. So individualism is so sacrosanct that in this view, being identified as a member of a group or class is the insult. That's what oppression is for liberals. Now for radicals, it's totally different. Society is made up of classes. And this was economic class in Marx's original version, but it's really any group or caste. So it's groups of people and some groups have power over other groups. In the radicals understanding, being a member of a group is not an affront, far from it. Identifying with the group is the first step toward political consciousness and ultimately effective political action. You make common cause with people who share your condition. The other big division is on the nature of social reality. So liberalism is idealist. And what that means is that society is made up of attitudes and ideas. And that means that social change happens through rational argument and education. Now materialism in contrast, that means that society is organized by concrete systems of power, not by thoughts and ideas, but material institutions. The solution to oppression is to take those systems apart brick by brick. So liberals will say, we have to educate, educate, educate. And radicals say, actually, we have to stop them. Okay, if you remove power from the equation, oppression looks either natural or voluntary, which erases the fact that it's social subordination. So this is an infamous article by one Robert Bennett Bean, who's from 1906, uh, but there's piles of others. And they're all desperate to prove, guess what? That black people are naturally inferior. So there's charts, there's pictures, it all looks really scientific, but this is the propaganda of power. For women, we have the same propaganda of power. This is Mr. Andrea Long Chu. His book, Females, A Concern, was reviewed in none other than the New York Times. So here's the quote, femaleness is a universal sex defined by self-negation. I'll define as female any psychic operation in which the self is sacrificed to make room for the desires of another. The barest essentials of femaleness are an open mouth, an expectant asshole, blank, blank eyes. Now he's saying that women's Sexual subordination is the definition of being female, right? It's women's nature. So I've been canceled by all, all three of my publishers, but this utter garbage gets put in the New York Times. And in case you think that Mr. Andrea is a one-off, uh, because some men find the word woman offensive, the New York Times has decided that, quote, individuals who have receptive vaginal sex is a reasonable replacement for the word woman. This is real. <laughs> Women are passive sexual receptacles for an active male agent. This matches rather precisely how Mr. Andrea defines woman. And it is of course, the entire endless point of pornography. Or as Catherine McKinnon said once so succinctly, man fucks woman, subject, verb, object. Now you're allowed to get angry at this, 
You don't have to keep being nice. So before I use the word gender, I'm going to define it. Uh, the UN says that gender is the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities appropriate for men and women. I think a lot of us are feeling that the word gender is irredeemable at this point, and maybe we should just say sex stereotypes for clarity. But regardless, race, class, caste, gender, these are politically real, right? They're brutally, viciously real. But it's the ideology of the powerful that always makes this claim for their immutable origin. So it's nature, it's evolution, it's God. It's something that very conveniently can't be questioned or changed. But from the vantage point of human rights, these are unjust systems that have to be dismantled until the categories themselves, race, class, gender, no longer have any meaning because the material conditions that create them no longer exist. What liberalism misses is that 90% of oppression is consensual. As Florence Kennedy wrote, there can be no really pervasive system of oppression without the consent of the oppressed. This does not mean that it's our fault, that the system will crumble if we withdraw personal consent or that the oppressed are responsible for their oppression. All it means is that the powerful can't stand over vast numbers of people 24 hours a day with guns. Now, luckily for them, depressingly for the rest of us, they don't have to. People withstand oppression using three psychological methods, denial, accommodation, and consent. Anyone on the receiving end of domination learns early to stay in line or risk the consequences. And those consequences only have to be applied once in a while to be effective. The traumatized psyche will then police itself. There are entire bodies of discourse that ask the question of how the powerful get the oppressed to internalize the values of the oppressor. It's why the word hegemony was invented. But the take home point, do not ever conflate consent with liberation. Consent is accommodation to unjust conditions that we do not control. Liberation is the complete overthrow of those conditions. So oppression, uh, this is Marilyn Fry. Um, and her definition, oppression is a system of interrelated forces and barriers which reduce, immobilize, and mold people who belong to a certain group and affect their subordination to another group. So this is radicalism in one elegant sentence. Oppression is not an attitude. It's not an internal feeling state. It's about systems of power, material reality. One of the harms of subordination is that it creates not only injustice and exploitation and abuse, but also consent. So she uses the image of a bird cage. One wire will not hold that bird, but oppression is like a cage. It's a system of interrelated forces. It's all the wires working together. If you don't see that it's a system of interlocking barriers, well, that bird just wants to be in that cage. The bird enjoys being in that cage. The bird is singing, she's eating, she may even be laying eggs. The bird is volunteering to be in that cage because it's the bird's nature to be in that cage. So the interrelated, interrelated barriers create subordination. Well, what's subordination? See, all of this has already been worked out for us. And there are plenty of days when I think we have no excuse, like the heavy lifting's already been done. So here's Andrea Dworkin, four elements of subordination, hierarchy. One group on the bottom has less power and fewer rights, resources than the other group, which is on the top. Um, and so that bottom group is seen and treated as inferior. Objectification. Members on the bottom group are treated as thing-like, as mere instruments for others' use, um, as commodities or as property. Submission. The bottom group typically complies with the wishes, the self-defined needs of the top group. Doing so is essential for their survival, and it's then, of course, used as proof of their inferiority. So it's this feedback loop. This is the situation the oppressed always face. Rock, hard place. If you submit, then you are subordinated, and that's the harm. But if you resist, you are punished until you are either dead or until you submit, and then you are subordinated. There's no way out, not as individuals. There are no personal solutions to social subordination. The only solution is organized political resistance. And finally, violence. Committed by members of the top group against members of the bottom group, it's routine, systematic, seen as right, necessary. 
inevitable, and of course, natural. Now, you can take all of this and apply it anywhere. Liberal, radical, oppression, resistance. This being a feminist event, I'm gonna apply it to women, which is how radical feminism was created. Women took the tools of political analysis learned on the left and applied them to our own lives. Teach slaves to read, eventually they revolt. Eventually, they write their own political theory. Without feminism, each woman is cut adrift in a hostile, chaotic sea. Apply the word sex class, and that chaos snaps into a sharp, subordination, a sharp pattern of subordination from the small daily insults to body and soul to the shattering traumas of incest and rape. The crimes men commit against women aren't done to women as individuals. They're done because women belong to a subordinate class and they're done to keep us a subordinate class. And this is what feminists began to see. The central elements of subordination, the hierarchy, the objectification, the violence, they were happening to women, but mostly in the realm called private, done by men who claimed to love us through actions that men experienced as sex. That's the core insight of radical feminism. Now, liberal feminists take the model of how men are oppressed and apply it to women. Liberal feminism tends to follow the civil rights movement and other male struggles. Uh, so what are all the ways that a group of people is barred from full participation in public life? Employment, education, law, and then you address those barriers, right? That needs to happen. I'm glad I have a checking account. I'm glad I have a credit card. I'm glad I can own a house. I'm glad I can marry a woman if I want to. All of that needed to happen. But putting women at the center of the analysis yields something different. Women's oppression is not at heart about barriers to public life. It's about how the entire private realm is in fact political. Rape, battering, incest, prostitution, and murder create a barricade of sexual terrorism. Keeping women out of civic life is really about keeping us dependent on our private owners. No leftist analysis has ever included the realities of women's lives. Indeed, the left has delivered us up to all men collectively. And that was one of Dworkin's major insights. The only difference between left and right is that the left wants women to be public property instead of private. If one woman told the truth about her life, wrote poet Muriel Rukeyser, the world would split open. Well, we did by the hundreds and then the thousands. And then we started counting. The numbers are a trauma all their own. Battering, for instance, in the United States, a man beats up a woman every nine seconds. One third of battering starts when a woman is pregnant and male violence, a man's willful fist or foot is the number one cause of birth defects in this country. 80,000 American children are sexually abused every year and 80% of the time, quote, a parent, is the perpetrator. Sisters, you know it's not their moms. One by one, men do this to the most vulnerable. Children are so easy to control and even easier to hurt. The small bones break, the fragile tissues tear, the fledgling self splinters from its only body. 80,000 times the world should stop spinning and it doesn't, and I don't know why. Globally, all of that happens and more. There are 60 million child brides, 200 million survivors of FGM, 126 million girls aborted for being female. This is why we call it a war. If these numbers aren't just background noise, the inevitable, unremarkable actions of everyday men taking what is theirs, but actual crimes done to human beings. If women are political subjects with inalienable rights, then there is a word for harm at this scale. War fits, but men scoff when we say it. Fine, but I would like to know what else to call it. The first wave brought us the rights of basic citizenship, to vote, to gather and speak in public, to run for office, to own property, to get an education. Throughout the 20th century, women made advances in the professions, the trades, and in the law. In my lifetime, birth control and abortion were legalized. Women made huge strides against employment discrimination and the silence about, about male violence was shattered. 
Feminists founded rape crisis hotlines and battered women's shelters, created rape shield laws out of nothing but sheer stubborn belief in women's rights, invented the concept of sexual harassment and got it in front of the Supreme Court. And we tried to do something about prostitution. And then the internet happened. Um, I don't know if it's possible to overstate the damage it's done to our brains and to our humanity, but the age of the image is here. And that image is the female body, objectified, stripped, bruised, starved, and even dead. The backlash to feminism was bound to come. Only now the boys have a whole new arsenal with which to punish us hard, fast, and publicly. Number one, internet search term. Number one, teen porn. 324 million hits, torture porn. Their hunger for this is bottomless. I was born in 1964. I remember the world before pornography took over. Yeah, it was there, but it wasn't everywhere. In my lifetime, I have watched as men have created a whole new regime of degrading and dangerous sex acts enacted without remorse on the bodies of women and girls, and then normalized into just regular sex. To the women who are younger than I, I am sorry. If it's any consolation, some of us saw it coming and we tried, but it was like trying to stop a tsunami. I'm not giving up, but we are facing a monster and he is legion because he is every man and he is everywhere. Sadism's only end game is necrophilia. And here we are. But for women and for the planet, he's choking her out too. He's fucking the planet to death. Okay, I've seen this, not in Mongolia, but where I live. I live in a temperate rainforest in Northern California. It doesn't burn. But the fires in California were so bad, the sky was orange for two days. It was like fog. I couldn't see my hand. It was a hellscape. Sadism ends at necrophilia. He won't stop until every living creature has been punished. We are going to have to take the system apart. His economics, his religion, his psychology, and most of all, his sex. The feminist movement has managed to get women a whole bunch of options for getting away from violent men, but what no one has been able to do is get men to stop. That barricade of sexual terrorism is what, what never changes. And now it's getting worse. So we are going to have to do it somehow, brick by brick, not accommodate to it, not make the best decision we can inside it, but take it down. This is what radical feminists know. No one wants to hear it, but it's true. The male erotic trinity, sex, violence, and death reigns supreme. Andrea tried to tell us this was the world she had learned through the childhood molestation, the battering, and the rapes, all the rapes. Men tell us who they are, believe them. When bison are under attack, they pack into a tight circle. Protected at the center are the mothers and babies. Next are the older calves, weaned and vulnerable. A defensive ring of cows without young comes next. And finally, facing out, stand the bulls. We are under attack. Every last creature is under threat. He has leveled mountains, believe him. If we all make that tight circle with mothers and babies of every species at the center, protected until the last, and plant our feet firmly on our still living earth, we can face him down. He has the rancid thrills of sadism and the sterile dreams of machines. We have love and our animal bodies and the stalwart light of every dawn. Don't let him win. Five words to live by. Thank you.